But periodicity, I am trying to understand how that could possibly model divisions of everything, the cognitive frameworks uh, that are uh, the building blocks of wondrous wisdom. And so since 2016, I've been curious because uh, bot periodicity describes an eight cycle, uh, the divisions of everything, they form an eight cycle. Is that just a coincidence? And so if you've seen uh, half a year ago, I gave a talk uh, on YouTube uh, to John Harland, uh, who's with me, about um, the connections with bot periodicity, how I'm trying to understand bot periodicity. Half a year later, I've made some progress in terms of understanding it. And also, I feel a little bit uh, inspired um, to see how that interpretation could work. Um, and then, so I want to give John uh, an overview of where I'm at. Uh, he's going to be learning bot periodicity. And so I really appreciate that. So uh, then he may um, pursue some ideas just in terms of understanding the fundamental league groups. So John Harland is, uh, teaches at Paul Mar College. Uh, we were graduate students together. He has a PhD in uh, functional analysis. I have a PhD in uh, algebraic combinatorics. Hi, John. Hello. This is uh, the video I made about bot periodicity. Does it model consciousness? Does it model the mental states on which uh, three minds uh, act that would be uh, uh, the unconscious, which adds a perspective, and then conscious uh, mind, which adds a perspective on a perspective, and then consciousness is looking at that from the side, a perspective on a perspective on a perspective. And there are these uh, divisions of everything. There are these kind of like mental structures, uh, like a learning cycle of taking a stand, following through, reflecting, or this twosome for questions of existence. You'd have opposites coexisting versus everything being the same as with uh, free will versus fate or with knowledge. This is not very visible in yellow, but uh, it's uh, four levels of knowledge, whether, what, how, why. So, uh, and they collapse at the, when you get to the eighth framework, um, they collapse. And basically because when you have a logical square, if you have, let's say all are known and all are not known and you add that particular uh, combination, uh, then the whole thing will collapse because uh, you, you're you claiming opposites, and so the system has to be empty, and so then maybe you could start further. So um, I talked about bot periodicity, and I talked about it, um, uh, how I was trying to understand it. There's many different flavors of it, uh, but in terms of understanding Clifford algebras, one thing that was uh, very promising was this notion of CPT symmetry. So that's a way um, to think about it. And John um, has a passion for physics and so intuitive understanding of Hamiltonians. And so uh, this CPT symmetry um, is um, one flavor of bot periodicity runs through, especially the charge conjugation and the time reversal. What are different combinations you could have, let's say, in exotic materials in topological insulators. And um, uh, so they are quite metaphysical. And so I thought, oh, I should learn that. So then what I'd like to say is that I found a paper that uh, I've sent to John, uh, which is for physicists. It's like a tutorial. And it was written maybe 2010, just as some major breakthroughs were being made uh, in terms of recognizing what's called a tenfold way in um, condensed matter uh, in the study of these topological insulators um, to realize that, oh, they're organized by bot periodicity of the eightfold type, which is uh, relevant uh, when you're dealing with, uh, let's say, real numbers but also uh, with the twofold type, which is when you're dealing with uh, complex numbers. Um, and so uh, this is uh, symmetries, dimensions, topological insulators, the mechanism behind the face of the bot clock. So it's by, uh, in the University of Illinois, you have uh, Michael Stone, Ching Kai Chu, Abhishek Roy. And it's really great in terms of concreteness. Uh, it's very concrete in terms of how are we calculating this? How does this um, relate? So. One of the things um, that I found very helpful is um, they talk about um, 
the embeddings of Lie groups. So let me see if I can just uh, find that. I think it's at the end, but here it is. So if you have, let's say this, uh, oh, it, R could be any integer, but it could be, let's say one. But basically if you have a 16 by 16 orthogonal matrices and that forms a group, there's this embedding of all these um, Lie groups. So within this, you can find the unitary group, uh, eight by eight matrices. Within that, you can find, um, uh, I think it's called the compact symplectic uh, group, four by four matrices. And then you can have um, that split up into a, 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 a direct, I guess, a product. Uh, so uh, where it'd be twice as small. And then you have their diagonal, which they share, um, which would be where they, 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 they have the same values. And then within that, you'd have the unitary and then the orthogonal, and then the orthogonal could split, and then you could have the orthogonal. So you get back to the orthogonal. It's an eight-step um, process. The crucial thing about this process that's very exciting for me is that it's all built from the same transformation, from the same uh, building block, using it repeatedly. So that transformation... And that can be thought of as an as a generator of a Clifford algebra. So they're called here, let's say, J1. We can have several of them. But that would be a what's called a complex structure. It's it's orthogonal. I think that's because it's acting on orthogonal groups. So and you can think of it as an orthogonal matrix itself. Uh, but it's a complex structure. It's imposing, or it's it's basically saying. Um, you know, and, and I, I have to develop intuition on this, but if you commute with this matrix, uh, J sub one, let's say, if you commute with that, then you are preserving uh, the structure in which you could encode, let's say, complex numbers. For example, as two by two blocks, where I would be the two by two blocks, zero, minus one, one, zero. So if it commutes, then those two W two blocks appear, if it doesn't commute, uh, then they won't. And if they and if it's not commuting, basically, uh, my understanding is that it means that there's this reflection added. So with the orthogonal group, uh, you have basically either uh, these are is isometries that uh, preserve the norm in Euclidean space, the notion of distance in Euclidean space, right? Path Pythagorean theorem. So uh, you can preserve, let's say, a sphere in two ways. Uh, you can rotate it. And that'll not affect uh, the the just the shape or anything, but you could also uh, invert it uh, or uh, or reflect it, let's say. Uh, and so, what's interesting is that the orthogonal group consists of those two cases where, like, either you just have a pure rotation or you reflect it and then rotate it. And then you can see if you take the determinant of those matrices. In the one case, it'll be plus one. In the other case, it'll be minus one. And I think they're connected, um, each of those possibilities, but the two are disconnected from each other, which is to say, if you rotate, you can rotate all you want, you're never going to get reflection. And if you've reflected, you can do that all you want. But uh, I mean, you can rotate all you want, but you're never going to um, get back, undo that reflection. If you reflect twice, that's a different story. Uh, you know, that uh, reflecting twice will get you back to where you started. So the crucial thing for me um, is that uh, if you just do that, well, so first it'll take you from the orthogonal to the unitary. But if you do it again, and you do it with a mutually anti-commuting linear structure, because if, you know, if it's the same structure, well, then you're not going to get anything. But if it's mutually anti-commuting, and that's the condition uh, for a Clifford algebra generator, it may be, for example, like J1, J2, equals minus uh, J2, J1. This is a fancy way of writing that using the delta symbol. Um, and also J1 squared equals minus one, J2 squared equals minus one, and so on. This is what you'd have for Clifford algebras where the generators are uh, squaring to minus one. So if you add a second one, well, then you look at what commutes with both of them. And so less will commute with both of them. Each time you add a generator, less will commute. And when you add that generator, um, that mutually commuting anti-generator, um, you're getting a, a qualitatively different structure. So 
you'll get uh, not the unitary, but you'll get the complex symmetric. And so if it's just a single um, of one of these complex linear structures, it, it, it's it's like, it's, it's a complex, it's, it's indicating um, the imposition of complex structure. But if you do a pair, it does quaternionic structure, okay? And so, um, so you should get like quaternionic blocks. And if you do three of them, it will be like a, a split by quaternionics, where you get a quaternion uh, plus a quaternion, a direct sum of course, it imposes that type of structure. So what you're getting, um, uh, you're getting this process step by step where you're introducing more structure that's also thought of as symmetry breaking. And that symmetry breaking um, uh, was proceeding. So you, in a certain sense, you have less symmetry, but you have more structure. Uh, and it's proceeding, proceeding, proceeding. But what's very curious is that the transformations all look the same. Uh, they are basically isomorphic. They are the same. All that you're doing is you're insisting that by you have this mutually anti-commutation, which means that they can't be the same. You know, if they're mutually anti-commuting, that means they're not the same. Otherwise, they'd be zero. So they're different. Um, uh, they have their own preferred bases, let's say, which are different. And so what I suspect or what this does for me, uh, we're having these very symmetric spaces uh, that are kind of like embedded in each other. And there's this gap between them. And that gap is created by a set of these mutually anti-commuting uh, complex uh, structures. So I am suspecting that they assemble themselves or organize themselves or can be interpreted exactly as these cognitive frameworks that I have been introspecting, you know, for 40 years or so, you know, ever since I was 17. So, um, so when you have a three cycle, taking a stand, following through and reflecting, the idea is that, well, that's the only way that your mind can fill the space if it's everything, you know, it's the only way because that's the only way that you can organize three things, so to speak, or two things or one thing or four things, uh, that there's this whole uh, limit, very strict limit on how you can organize perspectives. So the first interpretation is to say, oh, a linear complex structure is a perspective. And so uh, that's the hypothesis. Maybe any comments there, John, at this point? Or... Yeah, well, I think that, I think the symmetry breaking um, aspect of it is clear, you know, and I, I, you know, I appreciate they lay it out so clearly. It seems very concrete and it could be worked out, you know, just in detail on, a, on an example which I think we should do. Um, the, the link to wondrous wisdom is a, is a little bit hazy to me. I, I, you well, know, I mean, that's the whole goal. I mean, in the sense, like, I wouldn't be interested in this if I didn't think there could be a link. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, just, I so, just, it's just, this is obscure. I mean, although this is central to mathematics, like if you look at practically all of math is involved in some sense in these things, you know, in, in Lee classical Lee groups, first of all, but then in this relation, you know, whether it's differential geometry or algebraic geometry or algebraic topology, you know, analysis, uh, it's all here. Um, and so this is possibly the belly button of math, you know, the, the point, so the question, this is a research problem in terms of trying to understand um, what, would it, you know, how could this possibly modeling these cognitive frameworks or it just isn't going to happen? You know, yeah. That's the goal. So. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that, I think that, um, Again, my instinct, as I've been telling you, is to nail down the map, like, uh, you know, to get it to the point where, you know, you can actually work through, you know, very specific example, like breaking maybe O16 down into U8, into SP, you know, you know. Yeah, so, so I can, I can. Seeing how the, seeing how the, the symmetry breaking happens. Um, you know, actually understanding how the symmetry breaking happens in every single one of those cases. Uh, and 
Uh, and those aren't particularly large. I mean, if you go from 016 down to 01, that's not particularly large cases. Those are those are pretty pretty tractable, you know. Um, and um, well, so so to me, the the key is to understand O, you know, O2N or O2R. Um, but but what I want to that's understandable. I've been doing that. Uh, the tutorial, you know, explains that, and I've I've gone a long way. But I think the point is that um, how would you even know to do that? I mean, why would you do that? You see, because let's look at bot periodicity comes in a lot of flavors, right? So yeah. the the one that was invented, you know, where it came from, let's say. I mean, what Bod did, he looked at the homotopy groups. Yes. Uh, o infinity. Okay. He found this pattern that repeats. This was a big deal because uh, it related to the homotopy group of spheres. Right. right. So I learned about this eight years ago. Now, the problem with this is that you have to learn algebraic topology just to understand what it says. Yeah. Right. And so uh, I spent a year, I think, kind of like, uh, maybe not too intently, but um, uh, when Bo Gao had a, um, uh, he has a New York uh, category theory meetup and uh, he was, um, he became interested to study algebraic topology. And so I was studying with him from Hatcher's book. And so probably spent a year just learning the basics of uh, algebraic topology with his graduate student level textbook. So I can kind of lean, you know, I mean, at least I have a, I have a kind of understanding what this is, uh, but it's still, you know, very hard. And like to find a book that would uh, talk about this. So Dale Hughes-Muller has actually a book where this is discussed. But you see, that's just, you could, I mean, that's just, you know, that's like a PhD thesis anyway, or, or more, let's say, to try to do that. But then what's the easier way, right? Now, it turns out... Uh, but Bot and Atiyah and Shapiro, uh, they realized, oh, after Bot came up with this, and he did that using Morse theory. So Morse is a way of uh, using analysis to study, I think, critical points. Like if you have a torus and you just uh, almost scan it, let's say, like, you know, 3D scanner, and you scan it and you look at, well, what are the critical points? Kind of like if you had a water in an inner tube and you kind of looked at, the, you know, as the water went down, what would be the you know critical points in that inner tube? Uh, so that's how he did it. It's very um, involved. Um, but then they realized, oh, this periodicity comes up with Clifford algebras. Okay, so Clifford algebras have a periodicity that's also eightfold. And then they were able to show yeah. if you look at the representation theory of Clifford algebras, um, and you look at how they get related. Uh, they will give the same here, these groups, you see. But but the point of those groups is that um, those are just like shadows, you know, those are just like signatures or something, right? Like, that's not really, I mean, again, I wouldn't be maybe very interested in thinking, okay, they got an eight cycle, I have an eight cycle. But the fact is, is that this is very central in mathematics. And this is dealing with like, spheres on spheres, right? So this very highly symmetric thing. So if you're saying, I'm trying to model perspectives, well, a perspective being modeled by a sphere seems quite possible, you know? Like, And then when you learn about the CPT theory, so another way to go. So then I, 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 it took me a lot of effort. Um, and in the fall, I figured out basically how to calculate those representation theory quotients more or less. And then that was the subject of the last uh, video where I showed you. Mm. But then I noticed probably a more better thing was to look at these, let's say, topological invariants, which really is about CPT symmetry, so where it comes in condensed matter, right? And I don't know if I have a picture here, but basically we'll be able to we'll be able to see in the paper um, that because it has a more metaphysical flavor, like where like particle hole symmetry, you know, are particles and holes the same thing or not? Uh, you know, time reversal, does it matter if you allow for time to go backwards or not, let's say. So, and that relates to, uh, so that relates to superdivision algebras um, because um, uh, 
when you have these CPT, really what they are, you know, the point of all this is to say like, you can study O16, why would you think that's relevant? You see, that's the point is that like, uh, I'm just challenging you like to say, why would you care? Why would I care about O16 to say like, that's not listening for the clues, do you see? I mean, I've been looking at this for eight years, but trying to say, well, what are the clues that this could possibly model, you see? Well, the fact that it, it pops up in all these different contexts, I think is a tells you there's something central about it. Um, yeah, so that's encouraging. That's one clue, right? But, um, but another, let's say to go back to that paper, <clears throat> Um, so they talk about this embedding, which is very helpful for me, and I can go, you know, explain more about that. But then they, and then they explain how that kind of relates to the homotopy thing a little bit, like we're to symmetric spaces. So symmetric spaces are basically quotients. As you go through this, you're, you're, you're getting these, you can think of these quotients um, of one space with regard to another. But once they have all that, then they talk about the CPT symmetry. And, and so, uh, and this is something metaphysical like to think about like where you may have really good insight. Um, they're, they're looking at, the, let's say you have a Hamiltonian. They're saying, well, you could have a linear map. You could have a symmetry generated by a linear map that anti-commutes with the Hamiltonian. Okay, so pH equals negative HP, or you could say maybe pH P inverse equals negative H. Yeah. Now that would be a linear map. And they say, I think like any, Symmetry like that could be thought of as a sublattice symmetry, they call, but it would be called like a par parity symmetry or like a mirror symmetry. Maybe that's because of this minus sign. Okay. Um, but then you get two more symmetries that come up in physics. One is the particle hole symmetry, the other is time reversal. Now, these are anti linear maps. So they're saying that, like in the complex situation, anti linear would mean that, um, like they write here, Phi is antilinear if lambda is a complex scalar, and when you pull it out, it becomes a conjugate. So that would be antilinear. And this notion of antilinearity, it comes up also uh, when we um, have, let's say we have J1, that linear complex structure, and we add another J2 that's mutually anti-commuting. And it turns out you get a quaternionic structure where what you've done is you've to the complex structure, you've added this type of anti-linear thing. You've added, um, and the anti-linear thing is very interesting because it's it's modeling reflection in a sense. You can, I think you can think of like a conjugate as a reflection of the original complex number, right? So this notion of reflection, uh, which came up um, in the orthogonal case, like, you know, okay, you're reflecting it very much see, suggests like it could be modeling mental reflection, okay? So now when you impose a quaternionic structure and it happens to have not just complex, but it has this anti-linear part to it, um, it's kind of like saying, okay, you have a first mind, but then the second mind is kind of like reflecting on the first mind, okay? So that's encouraging. That's the kind of interpretation we're looking for. Now here, what it's saying is, okay, you have, um, an anti-linear uh, map, um, but in the one case, which would be particle hole, when you go CHC inverse with this map, you'll get negative H. But in the other case, if it's time reversal, you'll get positive H, okay? So those are two ways to, uh, two different, so that means that they're qualitatively different. And then the square is plus or minus one, and so uh, that means that, um, oh, this, there could be negative one, it could be positive one. So you have these different versions. So then what happens is that like, okay, uh, and I think that the P is the product of C and T. So if T, C holds and T holds, then P also holds, okay, in those cases. So um, what this means then is that with the C or with the T, in each case, you have three choices. C, H, oh, C squared could be plus one, C squared could be minus one, or C just maybe doesn't exist. So those are the three choices. 
and with t also it could be plus one or minus one or it doesn't exist so you have nine choices and then you have one choice let's say where um there's one more extra choice well i'm not sure i understand what doesn't exist um the symmetry may not be there there may not be that operator okay so if you have like a hamiltonian um mm -hmm. that hamiltonian okay. perhaps doesn't there's no operator that's doing this okay with regard to that whole thing does that make sense sir okay okay so let's look at so see then they encode it and they're actually showing they're going through all these ways to calculate the different cases and you know what to identify with what so that's they spell it all out then at the end they get this chart here it's this is a time reversal symmetry so these are the different um, labels that cartan used when he when he did this long ago um, and so this is work actually prior to bot, if I understand correctly, this 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 classification. So then they started realizing, oh, you know, uh, this is interesting, this connection. Uh, these Hamiltonians are these symmetric spaces, I guess, uh, or they're related to these symmetric spaces. And so um, these are symmetric spaces. Um, and then uh, they're related to these symmetries. So time reversal, zero means it doesn't uh, exist, let's say. Minus one means it squares to minus one, and plus one means it squares to plus one. And so then um, this is particle hole symmetry. And then this is their product, which would be the parity, or they call it the sublattice uh, symmetry. So it's going through, um, let's say, starting with this one. This is like the base one, I think, um, that would correspond like to the orthogonal 16. And it just runs through them in this order. Hmm. So so that's why I was trying to understand this, and this paper seemed to be very concrete. Give me a concrete way to understand this. And then I realized, oh, they're starting with the Lie group embeddings, you see. But then the Lie group embeddings, uh, well, first of all, that makes things a lot simpler, right? Because um, you don't have to do all this more complicated stuff. You just have to do, you know, you don't have to do topology. You don't have to do, uh, you're just doing linear algebra, basically. So that makes, that's very nice. But then they are building things up from these J sub I's, you see. So that all of a sudden clicks with what I want to be doing. Because all these other things were like signatures or shadows. Mm -hmm. But the J sub I's, you see, could be perspectives, right? Very much so. So this was a long way just to say, like, look, I'm not wanting to learn about periodicity. I'm trying to, and, you know, I mean, I thought if you can help me, that's fine. You know, I do need to learn it. But but really what I'm trying to do is to try to learn about wondrous wisdom. What does it mean to find math to model that, right? So we have to kind of look for things and get intuition based on that. Um, um does does that kind of make sense? Because otherwise, you know, we could spend yeah, a whole lifetime I, on this. I don't see the point. I think I understand the the overall thrust here. Um, to me, I look at the symbols on the page, and you know, I, I very much want to understand, you know, in detail what they're doing. So, I mean, that's kind of that's kind of where I'm at. You know, like right. Like how does all this work? I mean, um, and I think it's a considerable amount of you know. I mean, there's a lot here. Um, Mm -hmm. Although this paper seems to boil it down to, I mean, it, it just seems. Well, he's he's talking pretty... to physicists who just want to understand how to do calculations, you know, and how to think about this very concretely. So that's pretty much the situation I'm in. Yeah. Um, you know, where I don't, uh, I, I want to be able to look at this in a new way. So I kind of know the nitty gritty, but, but. But maybe just to say, and we don't have time today, but like to say, um. You know, we've talked before, like, you know, you start with the 016, you put down any of these operators, and you can write it as uh, in this form, because you can get to choose the basis you want to, and you can look at what, what, what um, commutes with it, and then you'll see that, oh, the stuff that commutes has to have this type of block form. So I'll be able to maybe do a calculation like that. Yeah, yeah. But... <clears throat> right but but see then it's more yeah. complicated to go from and so then that gives you the unitaries and basically that's throw away this reflection 
And again, this idea that the reflection could be mental reflection, you know, that we're throwing away mental reflection as we go deeper. We're throwing away the possibility of mental reflection. That's what allows us to look at these cognitive frameworks uh, without any reflection. That's mm. exactly what I'm doing uh, when I'm when I'm introspecting. Mm. So, um, and so then it's saying, look, if you do two of them, um, then you basically look at how you're acting on the quaternion uh, as a vector, let's say. And then, so you write this vector out and you act on the left in terms of matrices. And so you build those matrices up out of uh, blocks like this, you know, where these are four by four blocks, uh, where I is a two by two matrix and negative I would be the negative of that matrix. Uh, and negative, you know, one is the two by two matrix one, and, and I is the two by two matrix uh, zero minus one, one zero. So if you build up these four by four matrices, you act on the left, you see what happens. And then you can also act on the right by multiplication. And anyway, so they work it out. And then they say, look, uh, what you want to do is you want to have a matrix J. So like the Clifford algebra, these are Clifford algebra generators. And so we already have I, let's say we're going to keep that. You add J, I think sigma three is the poly matrix that goes a one negative one on the diagonal. So it'd be one, zero, zero, negative one. And so you make this four by four matrix and then that'll be the vector J. If you multiply these two, you'll get what is the quaternionic K. And so then you can see what survives all that. And then um, it'll be, I think it's block. I mean, I did the I did the four by four case. But so maybe I'll try to see if I can do it for the general case, but I think it'd be like blocks, like complex number X, complex number Y. Uh, conjugate negative y, and then I think it'd be conjugate oh. x. You get these types of four by four blocks, oh. and I think that would be what you want for. But again, so it says here, as J2 anti commutes with J1 in the complex space in which if you make J1 C like I, then this becomes a complex space, but that becomes a complex space, and it behaves as an anti linear map that squares to minus one. So then it has this anti, so it's not just like two complex things, two complex numbers. No, it's it, 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 it qualitatively changes. And so for me, that's like a reflection on a, so we've thrown reflection away, we've done it twice, but you still get this type of reflective uh, action uh, or, or attitude, let's say, on the, uh, on the other dimension. And then what you do is you have, um, you add a third one. And now the crucial thing is, see, now you can look at what happens if you have this operator K equals J1, J2, J3. And the crucial thing that happens is that, nor, you know, previously, all these J sub I squared a negative one. If you have the product of two of them, they squared a negative one. But once you have the product of three different ones, you can uh, multiply J1, J2, J3, J1, J2, J3, and you you know if you commute commute yeah, them, you yeah. get a minus one sign yeah. whatever it's going to become positive one yeah and then k squared right. minus identity equals zero that means it's uh, that becomes like a characteristic equation and that shows that the possible eigenvalues are one and minus one right mm -hmm. and then that lets you break down um, the vector space into two eigenspaces and now those eigenspaces don't necessarily have to both exist. Maybe only one of them exists. Um, so it depends on how you're looking at it, you know, like how it's, it depends on how they're all set up. But if you want, you should, you know, you can set them up so that you get them even equal size or you get them different sizes, you know, so that they add up as needed. But, um, but like for me, the crucial thing is, uh, oh, once I have these three, I start to get like three cycle types of things you see like where the three cycle would be let's say like well like it turns out j1 times j2 equals j3 when you're on the eigenspace v minus let's say mm -hmm. okay so you get these types of three cycle things mm -hmm. so then that's very interesting but like uh, that's not enough i need to you know have understand what's going on then but the idea then is that and again this is the kind of thing that's very uh encouraging you can think of a operator where you're adding all three at once. So that would, you know, if you add one at once, it's a complex structure. Two at once, that's a quaternionic structure, like with a 
perspective on it. So, but if you add three at once, you kind of have a three perspectives you're adding. Well, then you're splitting the space into two parts. It's kind of like you're splitting the space into two minds, so to speak. Maybe So maybe one mind is cycling forward, one mind is cycling backwards. Maybe that's the way, because when you reflect, you're going to go in the opposite direction. So uh, that would explain like V plus and V minus, because you get three cycles in opposite directions. So let's say you're going in the direct. So, so anyways, you get what you're doing with that is you're getting two minds that are operating in opposite directions. One that doesn't reflect the other one that reflects, let's say. And then if you add this J4, it turns out you can talk about J3, J4. And then that turns out to be an isometry between V plus and V minus. So that means that they have the same size. So you have to have made sure that your, your dimensions are going to allow for that. But so basically, if the okay. dimensions allow, then you do have this isometry. It does have this form J3, J4. So now you have <clears throat> a, like a mind that has, now that you have these two minds, the unconscious and the conscious, that are kind of lined up and equated, you see. So that's very much the type of thing I want. Also, if you say J1, J2 equals J3, if in the terms of the three cycle, it suggests that a perspective is equal to the opposite node. Okay, so uh, like so it says kind of like J1, J2 is a shift in perspective. I mean, like a shift in perspective is equal to the opposite node. So J1, J2 may be one perspective, one shift in perspective, J3, J4 may be another shift in perspective, and then they may be related by a shift in perspective. So that becomes um Interesting. But just talking to you, realizing, oh, those two subspaces allow for two minds that are operating in opposite directions, as would be expected when you introduce reflection, it turns all the arrows around. Mm -hmm. That you may, may, may not make sense to you or anybody, but but for me, that's a step forward. So, Okay. You know, I've, I've only got a few minutes left here. I yeah. Have Do you have concluding thoughts or... Um, no, I mean, like, I, I definitely want to, you know, I definitely want to understand this stuff. I mean, every time you go through it, 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 the, the different moving parts are in a little bit more alignment. You know, I mean, I, 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 I kind of see what's going on here. Mm -hmm. but again, to me, it's, it's all about understanding examples. You know, it's not, you know, like having a good right. or how this happens. You know, I don't think it's, it, it doesn't seem that mysterious to me. Um, it it's just that you know um there is some complication when you start adding these generators and demanding you know that you commute with more and more of these generators you're you're calling down the space into into more and more symmetric um you know lie algebras mm -hmm. you know, have, have, have greater and greater kinds of symmetry um and it'd be interesting seeing how that works on it, you know, going from, say, the simple example of 016 all the way down to 01. That's kind of what I, you know, once you, once you understand that, I think that, you know, that's probably a good enough model for at least understanding this this paper. Um, right. So I'll try to be, you know, you'll be reading about that, maybe working on that. I'll try to also, like, write out my understanding that I can, and then we'll talk about that. Okay. So I mean I can uh, you know I'm I'm pretty good at talking about each one of these Lie groups by itself like like mm -hmm. oh I think O N I I understand it's it's basic decomp it's orthogonal decomposition for each element of O N you know you get this mm -hmm. you get this kind of block block diagonal thing where you either get one negative one or you get a two by two block mm -hmm. on, on the main diagonal with a just a rotation a two dimensional rotation so we talked about that how how mm -hmm. every element of O of O N <clears throat> breaks, you know, breaks down under an orthogonal similarity to to a block diagonal like that. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, to me that's a good starting point because it it tells you how complicated can an element of O N be? Not very complicated. Not very complicated at all. It's either leaves an eigenspace alone or flips it over. Mm -hmm. or it takes a two-dimensional real eigenspace and rotates it um so that's about as comp and then and then that's it you know so it's quite remarkable that if you talk about a four-dimensional rotation it's really 
there aren't that many possibilities for how it can work. And, and the most complex... And those rotations you said are two, uh, two dimensional rotations, two right? Dimensional. So basically it's two orthogonal, two dimensional rotations is the most complicated thing that can happen in 04. And that's very, I mean, uh, uh, I should, I, you know, this is what I gained from letting you talk, but, but that idea, like you said, like that, oh, it's only two by two or plus one or minus one, starting to think like, what does that mean geometrically? See, as you go through and, uh, you know, or maybe I can do that as next time or whatever, but, and maybe I would invite Thomas, so maybe I would do it with him. Uh, but um, this idea that, um, when we have a space that gets fixed, you see, or when we have a space that gets flipped, because they have examples of that, like they break down these icon spaces, right? Yeah, yeah. Then they're not rotated, right? Because right. It's, yeah. it's either plus one or minus one or rotation, but it says that it's it's actually very, very simple. It's yeah. not the rotation example, right? So that's saying something very, um, at least now more richer to me to saying this is what it's not saying. It's saying that there is no rotation here, like in that case of the isometry. Well, we'll have to see different cases, but they yeah. go through. So I, have, I let you go. I just want to say a prayer of thanks uh, for you and for just walking the walk with me. And uh, we'll walk further. And whoever's watching this, let's walk together. Okay. Peace. All right. Peace. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. I did it. You can do it too. I went to the Patreon website. I searched for Math for Wisdom. I found it. And after three or four minutes, everything was filled out, and there I was a Math for Wisdom Patreon supporter. That easy.